Welcome to the Anthropology and Business Podcast, where you'll learn about the many ways anthropology is applied in business and why business anthropology is one of the most effective lenses for making sense of organizations and consumers. Through conversations with leading anthropologists working in advertising, marketing, consumer behavior, organizational culture, user experience, and many other roles, you'll learn firsthand what it means to do business anthropology and how the work differs from academic anthropology. We'll discuss issues like the pace and depth of research in business, our visibility and influence as practitioners, and what we can do to build our brand. We will also focus on the value and impact of our research in business so that we can help business leaders understand why they should be hiring anthropologists. I'm your host, Matt Arts, a business anthropologist specializing in design anthropology and working at the intersection of product management, user experience, and business strategy. Let's get started. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I'm here today with Stephen Garcia. Stephen is a cultural anthropologist at Team One, one of the uh, few people who's actually called an anthropologist. So I think that would be pretty interesting to talk about. Uh, Stephen, you've worked in advertising for you know over a decade or so now at previous places like David and Goliath. Um, so obviously a lot of great experience to talk about in the advertising space. Would you mind maybe giving us you know a, a little bit of an overview of education and your work career? Sure. Um, I'll try not to take too much time on that because it's a long discussion. But um, uh, I started uh, not as an anthropologist, but actually as um, as a strategic planner in advertising. Um, about now over 15 years ago, I started at, a, at an agency called RPA. Um, and um, I was very fortunate at that time. I was a, I was a junior planner. Um, and, uh, I got to, we, we were very fortunate at that agency because the strategy department was able to conduct, uh, market research on, on behalf of our clients and, and for the work that we did. Um, nowadays it, it's, it's more often the case that we're hiring a third party to conduct that research for us. But back then I, I got pretty much thrown in on the deep end to go and, you know, do market research, um, moderate focus groups, um, conduct what I would later learn was ethnography, but we called them shop alongs. Um, and, uh, you know, really just fell in love with that. As my career kind of uh, uh, progressed and I moved up uh, and onto other agencies, um, it became uh, less and less the case where I was conducting the research or, or having a, a major influence on it. And I was becoming more of the um, consumer of the research. So um, our clients would hire a, a market research firm. Um, you know, we'd be able to participate in the research uh, as the agency, uh, but we were much more of the consumers. Um, and oftentimes what ended up happening is that I would, um, I would end up getting a report um, that I would have to make sense of, that I would have to make actionable. And that became a real challenge. Um, I was never satisfied with the way the research was actually conducted. And so I um, came to a realization that I, that I needed to go back to what I loved the most, which was actually conducting and, and producing research. Um, and so midway through my career, I decided I wanted to pursue a graduate degree that would get me closer to do research. Um, at the time, I explored a few different options. I decided an MBA wasn't quite going to take me in the direction that I wanted to. I wanted something that was going to teach me method methods, um, that was going to kind of give me a good foundation in theory. I ended up meeting a couple of anthropologists uh, through a mutual friend, um, and uh, they pointed me to the University of North Texas and their applied anthropology program. And I had never heard of applied anthropology. I'd actually never even taken an anthropology course in my undergrad. So um, I was completely green when it came to anthropology, although my undergraduate degree was in um, media and culture studies at NYU. And so I was exposed to looking at, you know, how in that case, media shapes culture. And so I was already exposed to kind of some of the same uh, social theorists and um, kind of the same frames and, and lens of looking at the world. Um, but, uh, then I kind of I went on to, to pursue a, a master's degree at UNT 
Um, and that was a really great, um, gave, gave me a really great foundation um, to pursue anthropology. And at the time, I thought I was going to have to leave advertising in order to actually become an anthropologist. Um, I thought, you know, perhaps I'd go work um, uh, on the product development side or in UX um, or perhaps for a market research company. Um, so as I was completing my degree, I continued to work. Um, I continued to work as a strategist. Um, moved a couple agencies during that time. Uh, the advertising world, you, you move around quite a bit. Um, but it was um, around 2016. I was um, near wrapping up the program at UNT, and a really good friend of mine contacted me one night and said, hey, my agency is looking for an anthropologist. <laughs> uh, and I was like, wow, um, that's interesting. <laughs> I'd that's love great. to hear more. Um, and uh, so he got me in touch with the hiring manager who was a good friend of his. We had a conversation and it really was the perfect match, um, not only in terms of you know the right opportunity, but also my experience really um, was uh, crucial uh, for, for getting hired um, at where I'm at now, which is Team One. And so I was able to bring both strategy experience, um, having a background on the categories that the agency worked on. So I worked on automotive for a long time. Um, we specialize in premium and, and aspirational brands, luxury brands. And so I had an exposure on that as well. But then I brought this kind of new third layer of, of training and knowledge um, in anthropology, which is what they were really looking for. And so I've been at Team One now um, going on five years. Uh, and it's been both an exciting time and a very challenging time. Uh, but I've been able to build a practice. Um, I've been able to integrate uh, the practice into what we do in our in our strategy development process and our creative development process, and then more and more, I've over the years become very client facing. Um, I'm put in new business pitches quite a bit. Um, I um, when there are specific qualitative research needs, I'm very much brought into conversations with clients about that. Um, so it's been a, a wild ride, um, and one that kind of took some interesting twists and turns. Um, but it's been, it's been amazing to land where I'm at now and actually have the title of an anthropologist, which just, uh, got its own challenges, but also, um, opens a lot of doors yeah, in my cool. experience. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing all that. And, you know, just, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. One thing you said about how how you came into anthropology because actually i didn't say it in the intro but you and i entered the same cohort at unt right so and i had never taken an anthropology course in undergrad either so we both came in green as you said and i actually had an mba already but chose to go back to get the anthropology degree because you know the skills that i had i felt that they were still lacking in the research space so it seems like you know good decision on your end but um yeah i want to dig into the to your title, because it's it's having the identity of anthropologist is something that comes up a lot in conversations, whether it's like the New York business anthropology meetups or conferences. And so there's a lot of people out there who really want that title. And there's other people who say, I don't really care, you know, whatever. And there's other people who say, well, it's actually just more helpful to even identify something else such as UX researchers. So you just said that it's sort of a blessing and a curse. Um, so can you maybe tell me why it's both? Yeah, um, and it's interesting. I've I've heard I've heard both um, arguments, uh, and um, I, I've had that debate with myself about whether it was smarter to have the title or not. Um, in my own experience, I've learned um, that it's it's become a huge advantage for me um, because oftentimes, uh, I, I, you know, in, in advertising, we're very much open to new methodologies, new ways, anything that's going to get us smarter thinking, right? And so being able to 
leverage that for not only the work we do, but to sell that as a competitive advantage of how we do our work and how we do it differently. And so to have an anthropologist on staff not only just sounds really good, um, and oftentimes clients are very intrigued by it, um, but it also does affect how we do, we changes how we do things. And, and I'm very lucky that I've been fortunate enough to have an impact and play, play a part in that. Um, the challenge has been, and I think initially this, this probably was um, more of a challenge at the beginning when I started, but um, I was really struck one time I read uh, something by uh, Lucy Suchman who talked about, you know, how oftentimes anthropologists have a position in business settings as the other. Um, and I really related to that when I read that. Um, I came into Team One having worked at many agencies before, having been a strategist at that time for a dec over a decade. And um, so it was a very familiar place to me, but almost in overnight by having the title of an anthropologist on my business card, I became different. I became exotic. I became the other. Um, and so that was, um, that was a challenge because it, 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 it put the um, burden on my shoulders to have to explain what an anthropologist is, um, what they can do, and how it can possibly help. And that was both for you know folks that I work with, my colleagues within the agency, but then also my clients. Um, and having to find ways to explain that um, quickly with impact, um, ways that make it sound you know interesting and intriguing, but also um, you know, it's hard, to, hard sometimes to explain what I do without actually showing things. And I don't always, I don't always have that luxury of showing things. I have to speak it. And so I've um, been able to try a number of things over the years to see what, what has stuck and try those, try those out. Um, but yeah, that, that has always been kind of the, the challenge of, you know, feeling as the other. And nowadays I feel very much part of the process. Um, and one of the ways I did that was really to interject myself in the uh, in the work and business of my colleagues and what they were doing and, and how and finding ways that I could help. So, um, but the the title, you know, I think is depending on where you're at, what industry, um, your company, um, the openness of the company has to some kind of new ways of thinking. Um, you know, it could either. In my experience, it has very much open doors. Uh, now, what happens after that has been on me. And so that's been the real challenging part. Um, but, um, but I've had some good success. That's great. So you had said that, you know, you have to, you had to sell it internally and obviously to, to potential customers. Um, you also said that you had sort of learned some things along the way. So was it, was your pitch not working, you know, in the beginning? And did you find, you know, have you landed on something that maybe more consistently works? Yeah, I think, I think initially I tried to take the language of maybe academia um, and what I was reading in, in my books that I would, you know, that we would read in our courses and, and all that. And I would try to use that language. Um, and it was a higher bar for people that I was trying to sell internally to to understand that. It did, they didn't intuitively understand that. Um, I think what really learned and what really kind of, what I learned and what really worked for me in the end was kind of translating that into the language of business um, and translating that into kind of ways, frameworks and, you know, language that we use every day in, in our interactions with clients. So, um, you know, I would often talk about how what I able, I'm able to bring um, adds to, but is different from an understanding of demographics and psychographics. Um, and that instantly starts getting you to a conversation where they begin to understand what you're talking about. Um, and they become intrigued because it's that layer they didn't even know exists or could exist. Um, so I think that was been one of my big learnings is, you know, how uh, translating kind of our our principles and our concepts into language that can be understood. 
Yeah, sure. And that implies that you understand the language of, you know, the discipline and, and speaks to really one of our strengths about, you know, making sense, you know, of other groups um, and being able to sort of, you know, learn that quickly and sort of ramp up to get in there. But it, it does, for anybody listening who's maybe interested in the work, it does speak to the need to, you know, to appreciate the language of business. Um, you know, whether you agree or disagree with everything, that's maybe another debate, right? But we at least need to know it and really be an active player in that conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, too, um, you know, I think sometimes as anthropologists, we, we push against certain uh, words and ways of thinking. Um, but I think we have to learn oftentimes just to, how can we use it to our advantage to at least open the door to get someone to listen to us and pay attention. Um, that's the first challenge. So did you, did you have any other particular challenges moving into this role? I mean, obviously you had a lot of work experience, so it wasn't per se that you were, you know, upscaling on any of, you know, anything about the, the discipline, but besides like the title, was there anything else particularly that gave you a challenge? Yeah, I, I think, you know, after that, and I guess at the same time, that the main challenge was building a practice and what that really means um, within the walls of an advertising agency. Um, and so what, what was really important for me then to figure out, you know, I, I had very supportive uh, managers and my team was very supportive. They were very open to trying new things. And so I had that privilege of, just trying different things, seeing what stuck, um, but really bringing and trying different methodologies um, and and seeing what works. Now, the nice thing was that because I had been a strategist for song, I intuitively understood like the work that a strategist does. Um, you know how they use insights, um, what they how they leverage them, um, how they communicate them, um, how they translate that into actionable things that can be used by a creative team, a group of you know, art directors and copywriters to create the ads, but then also kind of helping to open the eyes of clients and see something, see the possibility in, in taking a particular direction. And so, um, you know, I think trying things out and, and seeing what anthropology meant in practice in, within the walls of an advertising agency was the next challenge. Um, and so, you know, I've been very much about, you know, a mixed methods approach. You know, sometimes my work involves ethnography, but not exclusively. Um, you know, I bring quite a bit of quantitative research into my work. Um, uh, you know, I've employed semiotics more and more often. Um, one of the big challenges is that, you know, I often, in the work that we do, you know, in general, in business, uh, you lack time and budget. <laughs> um, and in the advertising world, we, that's even more true, I feel. Um, and so, you know, I, to propose, like, you know, even a two-week ethnography is, is a lot of times out of the question. Or just, it, it, you would miss out um, on having an impact on the strategic direction in that amount of time. And so, um, you know, bringing in methodologies that could get us quicker answers, more informed answers, but still kind of get us, you know, looking at things and asking questions from a cultural perspective and bringing that perspective in. So, um, yeah, I'd say that was the next challenge was really kind of ma making the practice work uh, every day. Mm -hmm. And so on that point, you know, you, so you've now built a team uh, that means you're leading others as well, leading other researchers. So can you speak a little bit about that process and, um, you know, what you've maybe learned from that and some of the challenges of now, you know, sort of bringing up the next, you know, crop of, of researchers? Yeah, you know, I've, I've found that it's been a real challenge because I would love to bring more anthropologists um, to work for me. I have, I have one now. And the challenge has always been, you know, um, adapting to the environment of business and in particular the advertising agency i find that you know it, it's not just a struggle for anthropologists i think it's a struggle for anyone coming into into my field where you know the quick turnaround the kind of startup mentality um or culture you know where it's quick turnaround times you know as an anthropologist, you want to dig in deeper. You want to continue to do layers of analysis, but realizing that, you know, um, that that amount of rigor is not necessary, but rigor is still important. 
So how do you balance those things? Um, and the challenge has been bringing in, in talent who, you know, they're just fascinated by the work, but, you know, it, it becomes the, the working culture becomes very difficult and challenging. So, um, so I've always kind of geared towards someone who's had some experience in business that isn't not completely green. Um, but, uh, but I, I would say initially that would be the huge challenge in, in building a team is like, how do you bring someone who's going to have that kind of rich understanding of theory and method, uh, but who's willing to work fast um, and, mm -hmm. um, and try new things and incorporate new things. So. And, you know, maybe work on multiple projects at once of different subject matter, or work with, you know, potentially, you know, other disciplines that equally have, you know, valid input, though different, right? And, you know, obviously, uh, all of us are collaborating a lot more these days with many other people. And so, yeah, it's very different than academia, for sure. And uh, so I guess, to that end, let's say, you know, if, if somebody doesn't have business experience, but they're, you know, they're looking to get into this, um, you know, is there any particular skills that you think are, you know, that people should be looking at that are really important? Yeah, I think, um, I think our ability to kind of really, um, study any group as we would a culture, um, kind of works to our advantage. Um, so I would say, you know, kind of really turning your anthropological lens towards your colleagues and, and your work environment um, and, and understanding how the rituals of that organization, how people talk with each other, how they interact, what are kind of the artifacts that are created um, and, and, and working within those, but expanding them as well. So, you know, I think... Um, you know, I think we often deride, you know, the PowerPoint presentation, uh, but that becomes a critical way of communicating knowledge within the business world. So how can we add to it? You know, I think one of the ways I've had success is um, bringing in stories of the people that I meet, that I interact with, that I learn from, and really telling their human story, right? Um, and I've seen the power of that through... Um, through, you know, in meetings and even later after meetings where, uh, you know, people will, will refer to the names of the people I presented in, in, in a presentation. And, you know, what would, you know, so-and-so think about this? What would they do? Um, and so that, that's where I begin to see the real power of things and the impact of, of the knowledge we're sharing um, uh, come to life because people are able to remember and, and absorb uh, kind of some of the, the insights and the learning from, from real people. And so um, going back to your question, I think, you know, just uh, leveraging uh, the best of what we've been taught to understand and really uh, know people um, and applying that into your work setting, I think is really important. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, of course, the stories kind of really help color or bring life to the data. But, you know, on that point, I'm wondering, um, how are you approaching that? Is it mostly textual or are you also using, you know, multimedia to really convey, uh, you know, the sort of emotion behind that maybe? Yeah, I try to be as visual as I can, as the project would allow and, and timing. Um, so I've done everything in the past from, you know, we took a camera during our ethnography and, you know, we're able to get permission to capture people as they were, um, you know, taking us through their homes or, or being out in the world with us um, and working with, I'm fortunate that within the walls of Team One, we have a, you know, a production studio and able to have some really great editors put together some great research videos for us um, that really help tell the story of, um, you know, what we experienced out in the field. Um, that's been really important. We've put um, books together. I would call them like lookbooks or magazines where, you know, um, on one project I had um, an anthropologist who had a background in photography. So had some really great photos to share and stories to tell within that book. So that, that's that been, you know, and be able to pass on that artifact after presenting, a, you know, a 50 slide presentation is and has been really powerful to help um, 
people feel like they have a piece of the research with them and, and some understanding of what the, what the world looked like that we were um, studying. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, even in my power present, PowerPoint presentations, trying to be much more visual, um, um, uh, you know, using quotes, using video clips, um, but really just try to be more emotional, I guess, is the good way of putting it. Um, helping people kind of hear voices, um, hear stories that are relatable, um, I think is, is one of the powerful things that we can do. I think being descriptive in the way that, you know, um, that ethnographic description uh, is something that's really powerful and really changes minds. So trying to do that in more of my work has, has been kind of my goal. That's great. Yeah, it's one of the skills, you know, visual or sort of design skills is one of those things that I generally recommend to students or younger people who might reach out or, or really anybody who reaches out like looking for help. It's, I think it's just one of those things, you know, the more we can bring vis you know, visual elements to it, it really does seem to help sell everything. And so it's just one of those good things, I think, to upskill on. Yeah. But so in there, um, you know, in all your descriptions so far, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that you're doing, obviously, that is not just research you're, you're leading, right? So there's managerial elements to that. You're obviously producing, you know, decks and other sort of materials. There's, there's obviously the, you know, the need to, to plan, to recruit, you know, to do, uh, to analyze, right? To, to do all this stuff that's not always just sort of out in the field researching. So what could you maybe tell us a little bit more about your your day you know or, or your week or your month or whatever it may be just like sort of a bigger picture what is you know what does your job really look like as a cultural anthropologist in an advertising firm yeah my day is really or, or i would say my days and my weeks are, are really in flux um every day is a new challenge and that's what i love about that's what i've always loved about advertising and and especially in my new role it's kind of always you know, uh, I get a new question. I get a new, really interesting, juicy question that I am able to dig into. But you know, um, you know, starting with a Monday, usually um, we have a weekly status meeting with the strategy team that I work with. Um, and oftentimes, what I'm using that status meeting for is to hear what projects are coming. Um, what are some of the challenges that uh, our strategists are, are dealing with in answering some of the, the questions that are going to be coming up? ahead of them. And, um, and so my day, my, my week usually starts off with kind of reaching out um, to the strategist saying, hey, I know you're working on, on this particular project. How can I help? How can I bring kind of more culture to what you're doing? Um, and oftentimes I'll set up a call just to have a conversation with them and talk about where they are in their process, what they're thinking um, uh, so far, what they've learned, what, what, what do they need to know more about? And, um, and then turning that into to a cultural question. So, you know, the, you know, Tuesdays and Wednesdays might involve starting to dig in on that, whether it's using semiotics to answer a question about, you know, what does innovation mean in a culture today? Or, you know, what does it mean to be a mom in today's uh, culture, you know? Um, and then um, I also, one of my uh, responsibilities is to manage a big thought leadership initiative that has been funded by the agency nearly every year for the last 10 years. It started way before I did, but it's a project called the Global Affluent Tribe. And it's essentially an ongoing study of, um, you know, the world's top 10%. Um, for many years, it, it's been largely just a global survey. Um, and since I took it over a few years ago, I've been very much about bringing more qualitative methods in to kind of dig deeper on, on some topics. And so, um, you know, the part of my week might involve something to do with that, whether it's um, working to set up a new, new research study um, or, uh, you know, getting calls from a partner ag agency within our holding group who's interested in learning more about, you know, the affluent and what drives, uh, you know, their consideration when it comes to choosing a brand and, and all of that. And so um, getting on a phone call with them to kind of share some insights that I might have, share some data. Um, and then towards the end of the week, you know, I think there's always a, a portion of um, needing to just keep tabs on um, what's going on in the world, um, I would say, and kind of bringing in that layer of thinking and, and being armed with it. So, you know, um, 
oftentimes, it, this is a very much a creative field. So oftentimes, um, one of the kind of responsibilities of traditionally of the strategist, but now more and more my role is to provide inspiration, especially during a creative briefing with creative teams. And so there'll be they'll come up questions about, you know, if we're we're kind of doing something new around innovation and touting uh, in the innovative part of a, whatever product we're selling. It's, you know, what are different ways that culture, it, there, that innovation is manifesting in culture. And so I use a number of third party tools to help me understand just keeping track of what's going on in the world. But then also, you know, are there any trends? Are there any um, interesting th happenings out in culture around in the world in space of innovation? that could help um, inspire some new thinking. So, um, you know, I think every week is a new challenge and it's, it's, it's really fun, um, but I hope maybe that gives you kind of a good variety of what my, my week looks like. Yeah, no, thanks. And, you know, I think the thing that jumps out at me is there's obviously a lot of communication, yeah. right? There's, there's a lot of dialogue. And so how, you know, how has that been impacted by COVID with you all remote? Yeah, you know, um, I, I guess the biggest challenge with uh, COVID is that initially, like I mentioned on Monday, I would have a status meeting um, and um, and then I would usually follow up with the strategists at some point. I'd walk by their desk and have a conversation with them. And I, I did that very early on to not only build relationships with the teams that I work with and kind of help them help become more visible for myself. Um, but also just to kind of learn what they were doing um, and, and kind of find ways to help. So it always started with a conversation, usually at their desk coming by. As years went on, I, the, the nicest thing and when I knew things were working is when they started coming to me more often than I was going to them because I had enough work um, where, uh, you know, they, they were often hunting me down, trying to, to get me involved in conversations. But... Um, but nowadays, you know, obviously with COVID, you know, we're, we're very, we're, we're all working remote. Um, we were really lucky in that we were already set up in the best possible way for remote work. We were using Slack and Microsoft Teams and Zoom. And um, so oftentimes I think those conversations that would have normally just happened in hallways or at someone's desk now just happen on Slack. You know, I'll just send a note. Um, and the nice thing about that is I can do that and multitask and get my other work done. So I could say, hey, I know what I need to hit up that person this week because I know what's coming uh, in terms of what they're going to need. So trying to get ahead of that and meet with them as soon as possible. So normally it's like hitting them up and on Slack and saying like, how can, how can I help? Can we hop on a, on a you know, quick call to talk about that? And, you know, most of the folks that I work with now have been working with me for a number of years. So when I say um, now, you know, hey, can you talk? That they're willing to give me the time because uh, they know um, that, uh, you know, that they're going to get some additional help on that. Cool. How about you know, COVID and research? You know, how has that uh, I mean, I know you said you're using you know, mixed methods approach, but for the, the qualitative piece, what have you been doing there? You know, I guess one of the silver linings of this is that, um, you know, we've had to take a lot of our research online um, uh, and do more digital kind of assisted research. Um, and that's not something I, I um, employed a whole lot of before COVID. So for me, it's been um, exciting because I've been able to leverage new platforms that I had never leveraged before, you know, try to adapt some of the in-person techniques that I would do um, to, you know, a, an online experience. Um, but, you know, I hope in the future that, you know, we can do stuff more in person. Um, you know, I think observational research is a big part of what we, what my practice does, you know, um, you know, we the, already the agency was very much uh, committed to doing more uh, in situ work, in situ research. So, you know, they they would call it instead of ethnography, they would would call it consumer context research or um, retail safaris. Um, and so, uh, I think you know, I hope to do that again someday, where you know we're able to learn about the world of particularly luxury brands and luxury experiences but actually by actually experiencing them firsthand um and those are things we have not been able to do 
as a lot of people have not been able to do. So I think, I hope in the future that uh, we're able to get more out into the field. But, you know, I think the benefit of doing research online is that we can talk to a, a more diverse group of people from many different parts of the country and the world. Um, you know, it, it's oftentimes more comfortable for them. Um, they're able to participate and willing to participate since they can do it from the comfort of their own homes. Um, and honestly, I do feel that, um, I, I feel sometimes that uh, research participants will um, slip <laughs> when they're doing something like recording themselves, talking about buying a particular product or when they're taking us on a, you know, a journey through their home. They're, like, they're willing to say things that maybe they wouldn't necessarily say to you in person uh, because they don't know who you are. They, they're, they're not seeing a, a person in front of them. So uh, those... Uh, those slips allow for what my, my manager likes to call dirty little secrets <laughs> um, that they reveal. Um, so I think, I think going forward, you know, digital was already kind of having an impact on research and it will continue uh, to be much more impactful. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It seems like many things with COVID we've learned that it can work. And so we'll likely have some mix going yeah. forward. So you've, ever since we met in 2012, you have been, you know, I, guess, I think working with luxury, at least some portion, right? I know you were working with luxury car brands yeah. back then. So, you know, I don't talk to too many people who work in the luxury space. So maybe we can dig into that a bit. That might be you know, just interesting for anybody listening. And so, you know, first off, you maybe want to just give a maybe brief overview of the type of luxury products you've worked on. Yeah, so I mentioned uh, automotive. I've worked on quite a bit of luxury automotive brands, currently Lexus, uh, but also Audi um, and Acura, uh, as well as non-luxury automotive brands. So I'm pretty well steeped in the, in the culture of, of automotive from a business perspective. Um, but also um, luxury hospitality, uh, the Ritz-Carlton, St. Regis. Um, and so those kind of form the, the primary ones. Um, but then also, you know, there are many brands out there that, you know, they may not be luxury brands, um, but they'll have premium price products within their portfolios. And so um, kind of understanding um, affluent consumers, what their needs are, what their desires are. Um, and, and, you know, I think in, when we talk about affluent consumers, we talk a lot about aspirations um, and, and beliefs uh, because, you know, luxury products, luxury brands, those are almost pure marketing. <laughs> you know, the, the quality obviously sometimes is better, but oftentimes it's a lot about making people dream and, and aspire to something and, and wish for something. Um, and so that's, that's been really interesting as an anthropologist to study all of that thing about how we make meaning through the products and, and brands in our lives. Um, and so I think that's one of the powers of bringing anthropology to an agency that um, does focus on affluent consumers, does focus on premium price products, because it is a lot about meaning, meaning making um, and shaping that meaning making. Mm -hmm. And so two things I'd like to ask there. One is maybe about you know, what sort of you know, theories have helped you make sense of that all. And two, I'd like to maybe hear a little bit more about the you know, just the sort of mechanics of conducting research, you know, with, you know, with people of affluence and is that maybe more challenging or less challenging? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think um, a lot of what has influenced my work has been, you know, the, you know, cognitive and interpretive anthropology, um, Clifford Gertz, certainly, um, uh, you know, I, 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 using a lot of schema theory with, you know, Roy Dundrade and, um, understanding cultural models and leveraging that in my work. Um, there was a specific project where we were working on understanding how influence works among the influential. And um, we went to study this in the field where we um, were able to identify some folks that had real influential standing within their social groups. And we spent time with them. We went to uh, their workspaces, many of which they had founded themselves. Um, we went to places where they kind of hung out. Um, so uh, a lot of them were members of social clubs. Uh, so we went to, um, hung out in private member social clubs and met some of their friends and um, colleagues. Um, and that was really 
fascinating to then look at, you know, how does influence work in a slightly different process? So normally we think about influence in terms of uh, in a very transactional way, a very Machiavellian way where, you know, it's about giving and, and getting. Uh, but one of the ways we were able to kind of turn that on its head was we had observed that in um, out in the field, especially among this more affluent audience, this idea of influence was very much about giving. And so uh, we were able to bring in um, theories about gift giving um, uh, to kind of help us understand, you know, how does it work and how how can you activate on that? So this idea of a gift giving system that is um, composed of gifts, exchanges and reciprocity. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, Victor Turner also influenced a lot of that, that thinking that we had in terms of ritual processes and stuff. So, um, and then of course, uh, Bourdieu, uh, you know, a distinction that that's kind of the seminal work when it comes to um, affluent audiences. Uh, and so, that has been really, really helpful because it's been able to, I've been able through leveraging theory, leveraging frameworks um, to bring in new thinking. And, and um, I think that's kind of the currency in which uh, in my industry we trade is kind of a new way of seeing things, new, uh, new insights, um, changing people's assumptions and challenging those assumptions, I think um, has, uh, been something that I've been able to leverage as a key differentiator in the kind of work that I do. And as a result, uh, as an agency, we're able to say we, we approach things differently, which, which we do. Mm -hmm. And so on that point, um, you know, earlier you said when you were, you know, selling anthropology, if you will, to your colleagues and customers that you learned that you needed to reframe your language from the academic to the business. So how do you, you know, in your work, which is ripe to bring in all of these theories, how do you really go about that? Are you unveiling the curtain and, and showing them kind of, you know, where you're pulling your ideas from, you know, all these frameworks? Or are you still repackaging that just to maybe pass along your insights that are guided by those theories? Yeah, I would say it's more of the latter. Um, you know, obviously, you know, if I'm bringing in a theory, I'll mention who the theory is from uh, and maybe a little bit of background on it, but really just getting into how does it apply to what we're working on now? How does it apply to help us understanding the problem that we're trying to solve in an interesting way? So, and I've, and then I, again, like I said earlier, I uh, tend to be much more of a visual person. So trying to create that visual framework that can be communicated in a slide with some actionable insights that we can be taken as a result of like looking at it in this way, um, that has worked pretty well for me. And so, you know, I always kind of play it to the audience, um, you know, if, uh, some clients are very open and intrigued by that kind of work. Um, and I, when I say clients, I mean both internal at the agency, the people I work with that I also consider my clients, but then also the external clients, uh, the, the, the folks that hire us. Um, and so, uh, you know, kind of trying to gauge what the appetite is for that level of thinking. And most of the time they're, they're pretty open to it as long as, um, it helps solve the the problem that they're trying to understand or, or solve in, a, in an interesting way. And in terms of go going back to the actual sort of mechanics of, of researching affluence, so, you know, did you have any challenges, you know, with people of affluence wanting to let you into their circles, like say a private social club, you know, was that any particular challenges there that were interesting and, you know, how, how was everybody, were they receptive? Yeah, I think, um, well, two things on that. I think it is a real challenge. Like it, it always is a challenge to find research participants, um, good research participants that, um, and, uh, it's particularly hard to find affluent participants because they, you know, you won't find them in the traditional kind of uh, you know, resources where we go to recruit folks from panels and whatnot. Um, the higher up you go in income and net worth, the harder it is to find folks like that. Um, and so I've had more success kind of through, uh, you know, more snowball sampling approaches where we kind of are able to find someone who can be um, our connection to a, to a particular group um, and recruiting that way. The second point I wanted to make is that oftentimes and this is where the title kind of comes in and helps is 
um, referring to myself as an anthropologist with an affluent person and wanting to kind of talk to them and study them, they find it fascinating. They're like, they're, they're actually uh, find it um, flattering that an anthropologist would kind of take an interest in them. Um, and so uh, I haven't, I, I've learned not to hide that fact because um, oftentimes it opens more doors. <laughs> um, and especially if I'm trying to, you know, have uh, someone who's on the inside helping me make more connections to a group, that's usually how they'll, they'll, help, they'll help me by saying, hey, like, uh, I've met this really interesting anthropologist. And oftentimes because they find it fascinating, not only, uh, not only is it flattering, but it, it's um, fascinating intellectually for them. And so they oftentimes want to hear kind of the, the, the stuff I'm learning on whatever topic I'm researching. So uh, like in that influence study I mentioned, um, first of all, they were intrigued that we would even think they were influential um, and you know, learning about how they actually considered themselves and how their friends did, that was really impactful. But then when they were able to introduce us as, hey, I, I met a couple of anthropologists and they want to learn <laughs> more about me and my, my, my friends, like, were you willing to talk to them? That, that tended to open some doors. And so when you, when they learned that you felt they were influential, what were like common reactions, you know, what, what were the perceptions of that? You know, I think um, among the group that we studied, it was really interesting. I think they would never call themselves influential because that was, um, you know, perhaps a bit gauche uh, <laughs> in, in their friend group, you know, but, but you would talk to colleagues of theirs and um, and just have them talk about that person, you know, what, what they had learned from them, how they had met them, why, why they spend time with them. And, they, and they, they would describe them as influential people, people that they would look to for mentorship, for uh, guidance, uh, for connections, for, um, you know, uh, help, essentially. And so, um, you know, uh, I, think it, I think it was a bit of like, uh, no one would actually, if you call yourself influential, you're maybe not. Uh, but it's uh, definitely the, the people in their circle would point to them as the influential ones in the group. Had it. And how much, um, you know, whether in any of the studies you've done for client projects or maybe this yearly survey, is there any difference between, you know, wanting to make, you know, wanting to, to acquire these luxury products you know, for maybe the status it gives you versus maybe something more like monetary, like just investment? You know, is there any sort of distinction there? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, it, it really depends on what we're talking about. Um, I think when we're talking about a, a luxury watch, there is certainly uh, an investment there that grows over time that makes that product worth it. Um, but more and more today, I think what, what we're learning is that, you know, um, the power of the badge is declining. So simply having a luxury handbag or a luxury car, you know, those, those things uh, have less power to communicate um, about the user than they once did. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, a number of factors around globalization, digitalization, um, the presence of technology in our lives, and, and certainly, you know, the democratization of luxury where, you know, Nowadays, many luxury products can be brought, bought at a discount. Um, and so the power of that badge to communicate something of prestige or social status about the person that wears them, that, that has declined. And so now more days, it's about experience. It's about um, the experiences that you have access to due to your privilege and your wealth, um, the knowledge you have through those experiences that you've gained that really say something about who you are. And so what we're seeing today is that the affluent are really now um, being much more, uh, con their, their consumption patterns are much more considered in terms of, uh, you know, what, what is this? Why is it the best? Do I know something about it? Do I know something about how it was made, the vision behind it? Um, and if I choose to pur purchase it, you know, what does it really say about me? And is it the right, right signal I want to send? And so you'll see um, more and more, you know, the affluent are really kind of rejecting um, certain things because it, it's sending the wrong signal about them. Um, and I think certainly in today's world where, you know, populism, populism is at an all-time high, being very conscientious about this, uh, the, 
the, the what you're signaling out to the world that, that I think um, the affluent in particular are becoming much more uh, aware of that and, and conscientious about that. Now that said, you know, they still like high quality things. They like to treat themselves. Um, you know, we very much, um, you know, the concept of meritocracy is alive and well. <laughs> and so um, treating yourself and, and, and buying products that say, you know, I've earned this um, is also a huge motivator for this group. Um, so, you know. And one point of maybe clarification for, for me. So when you say the experience, it's shifted to the experience. Do you mean like shifted to the experience of consuming something such as a product or the or it's shifting to experiences like, you know, a trip on a yacht to see some fancy boat race or something? Yeah, I think, uh, well, both probably. Uh, I think I, I meant it more in the latter in terms of experiences now are what distinguish you. The experiences you've had, whether that's been where you've traveled to and what you've done there. Um, you know, um, it, it, this idea of, um, um, mastering something beyond your day job. So, um, you know, a lot of the affluent really prize people who are multi hyphenates, you know, they're not just the doctor, the lawyer, the entrepreneur, they have some passion that they've been able to really master. Um, so, in that influence study, for instance, uh, we were often told about a particular person who was a lawyer by day, but then had a passion for music and became a DJ by night. And so he was a lawyer DJ. And that person was someone who had a lot of prestige and social standing within that social group because they were really just interesting. And I guess when you're in a crowd full of overachievers who have gone to top schools and started companies, like doing something really interesting <laughs> helps you stand out. Um, but yeah, the experiences, you know, I think it's, it the, the, the thing about experiences is that they're hard to replicate. So, you know, someone might be able to buy uh, a luxury handbag uh, that you have that is even maybe better than yours, uh, but the experience is hard to, to replicate. Um, and that becomes unique and ownable by the person who's experienced it. Um, so, you know, when it, when it comes to travel, it's not just being able to say you've gone to Paris or London on the weekend, but, you know, you went to some far off destination and had some transformative experience where you learned more about yourself uh, or maybe you disconnected and you found some, some peace uh, for yourself. Um, those are things now that ha have kind of more, um, more prestige than, than the badge alone. Yeah, cool. Fascinating. And you know, just there, you mentioned the lawyer who turned DJ. You ever hear of, I, I think it's the current CEO of, of uh, Goldman Sachs is also oh, a I didn't DJ. Know that. <laughs> yeah, he has a SoundCloud account. Oh and wow, it's he's a multi hyphenate. It's either the current or the former, but yeah, it's. it's I'll have to if you find that. Up, you'll find it. You know, you um, I, uh, <laughs> an, a, a scholar who has written a lot about this is uh, Elizabeth Curid Halkett, and she came out with a great book in 2017 called "The Sum of Small Things: um, A Theory of the Aspirational Class." Uh, I highly recommend it to anyone who's interested in kind of the world of affluence and, and luxury brands because um, she talks a lot about like the power of the badge waning um, and this idea of, of knowledge and experience coming and rising supreme. Um, and so, you know, that certainly happens at kind of the upper level of, of you know, affluence, but when it trickles down towards, you know, more of, I guess, the masses, you know, um, it's all about signaling your knowledge, right? Like what you have on your tote bag and the podcast you listen to um, and the, you know, funny, the t-shirt the with the funny saying on it, it says a lot about who you are and it's signaling quite a bit. So mm -hmm. uh, fascinating stuff. Yeah. Well, very. Yeah. And, and though, uh, yeah, though all of us may not be able to still attain some of the expensive experiences, it will be interesting to see where the goalpost is pushed next you know, as as increasingly more people are focused on experiences as a whole and and owning less, and yeah. so yeah, definitely a ripe space yeah, for research. What we what we we recently just got a new wave of data back um, uh, from our global survey, and we asked a lot of questions that probed around you know changing attitudes post COVID, um, and uh, what we're seeing is a lot of people are becoming much more conscious about the impact that their travels have had or, and are going to have and wanting to make less of an impact um, and, and be kind of more uh, conscientious about those things. So I think, um, you know, 
the pandemic and and the lockdowns and quarantines and not being able to travel has obviously created a like a lot of pent up demand for those things. Uh, so I think travel will return, but how we travel and 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 what we do there, I think, will will alter. Very cool. Yeah, very fascinating. I'd love, love to dig into it more, but in the spirit of, you know, trying to sort of, you know, appreciate your time and, and keep it relatively short, sure. I'd like to maybe pivot. And, um, you know, for for anybody, maybe like pivot to sort of help others now, you know, how, how might they maybe do some of this this work? So if, if there's anybody who's maybe interested in kind of getting into the type of work that you've been speaking about today, you know, aside from things we have already discussed, is there anything else you might suggest, you know, broadly speaking, whether that's maybe more education, you know, either self or formal or just additional skills or anything? I, yeah, I, I would say that uh, on the education front, um, getting a master's degree for me was really a game changer. I think um, obviously because like, obviously because I hadn't been exposed to anthropology before. So there was that. But going into an applied anthropology program was really I think hugely impactful for me because, um, you know, I felt that we got a good foundation in, in theory, we got a good foundation in methods, but then having to take all of that and apply it in some real world way, almost every course was really, uh, I think helpful because it, 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 it forced us to be, um, to think about problems, to think about solving problems, uh, using culture and under our human understanding. Um, and then, you know, um, how to apply that in a way. And always that, it was always that next step of like, you've had some interesting findings now, now go apply it. What do what do we do with it? What does it matter? I think those are really powerful. So, you know, I think there's a lot to benefit from particularly a master's degree because, um, it, it does tend to be more practical, um, and kind of talking about that next step of like, what does it all mean and how do we use it? Um, in terms of other advice, I guess I would give is, you know, um, I, I would encourage anyone who is an anthropologist, wants to be an anthropologist, um, I, I would encourage them to pursue a career in, in advertising and marketing. Um, you know, I think it's, it's not common to have the title of a cultural anthropologist, even in advertising, um, but there are many anthropologists working in, in the field um, that are named other things. So, you know, I was a strategic planner, or what we called an account planner many years ago. Um, and there are still anthropologists who assume those titles and, and work in those roles. And um, I think, you know, having that anthropological lens and way of looking at things makes, has made me help our strategist and be a better strategist myself. And so I think for them, I, you know, um, even though their title might not anthropologize, be anthropologists, they certainly use that way of thinking all the time. Um, and then, of course, there's other opportunities to work in an advertising agency, you know, in data analytics or social listening. Um, we have we have UX researchers where I'm at as well. They're, none of them are anthropologists, but that's a potential avenue for, for getting into advertising is, is through UX research. Um, so... Definitely would encourage those to, to, to look into advertising as a career path. I think strategic planning is probably the, the quickest way in um, because already, you know, as a, as a strategist, uh, when, when that was strictly my role, you know, I was talking to people, learning about people, um, using human insights as much as I possibly could to make the strategy that more impactful uh, and more inspirational for the creative team. So um, I think I think anthropologists can do a strategy a strategist job quite well. Um, so I would encourage uh, people to to look into those. Um, and then I would just you know I think um, beyond going what I talked about earlier, what which was about like kind of looking at the culture of business as a field to learn from and study and and kind of pick up the language. Um, I guess I, I would um, encourage anthropologists to kind of, you know, it, if, if the business field is right for them, and one of the ways to kind of answer that is to think about, you know, how do you want to work? Um, do you 
do you would you thrive in an environment where um, you know things are quick paced, um, quick turnaround, uh, but where you can have a lot of impact because you're part of the building process of something? Um, if that excites you, and and you know, um, and then one of the things that's great about I, I have found about being an anthropologist and from other anthropologists, like we're comfortable with the ambiguity almost, like we're. We're comfortable going into the fog and not really having a clear sense of moving forward, but we get excited by the process of, of learning, investigating, figuring out ways and methods of actually answering and solving a problem. And we have the tools to help us do that. So um, I would say, you know, if, if all of that excite, excites you, pursue, you know, um, business as, as, a, as a way of kind of applying what you've learned and, and what gets you going every day. Agreed. And, you know, that brings up maybe one last question, which, you know, your, your title is cultural anthropologist. You and I both went through the track at UNT, which, you know, it was more or less like the business anthropology track. And so, you know, is there any reason you use cultural anthropologist over business anthropologist? And maybe how would you even define business anthropology? Yeah, I, 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 again, I would say I play to the audience when it comes to that. Um, obviously, my title at the office is cultural anthropologist. That's literally what's on my business card. And so I assume that role. Um, I think business anthropologist in the context I work in would probably add another layer of explanation that I wouldn't want to have to get into. Um, but, you know, when I'm around other anthropologists, I'll kind of use uh, business anthropologists as a way of, of, um, of explaining that. Um, I think, uh, you know, to my clients, it's, you know, I, I oftentimes have explained that I, for many years, was a strategist in advertising, um, working in many of the categories, maybe the category that they're in. Uh, but now I'm bringing this new layer of training and, and knowledge to help inform and make us smarter. So it's, you know, bringing anthropology to answer things uh, and understand people um, has has worked well for me. But um, but yeah, business anthropologist, I, I I have used it, and I I think my identity is more there. I think certainly the business anthropology summit in New York. Uh, the first time I went to that, I felt like I had found my tribe. <laughs> Um, I've gone to Epic and Epic is fantastic. It's just, uh, the world of UX is, is not, I'm not as close to that or, um, and, and I don't work in a technology setting exclusively. So, um, you know, I don't always feel, uh, part of that tribe, but the business anthropology summit has been great because I found others who either have worked in similar fields or adjacent fields who have gone through the same challenges. Um, and, uh, and we're kind of like this, uh, smaller excited group that's just excited to start something and it's been nice to be a part of that yeah great so um you know to wrap up is there any anything that you'd like to mention you know you anything that you're working on outside of work or just anything that you're passionate about um yeah i think uh i i have continued to uh find ways to explain what I do and, and build a, a method around that. Um, so I, I think uh, I'm really excited about building on what I've learned uh, on my day-to-day -day job um, and, 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 and evolving that. Because I think there is a real need for this, a need for anthropology, a need for a cultural perspective, not only in, in the work that I do at the agency, but especially our clients. You know, they don't get this information. Um, I, I think just the idea of, you know, to a lot of my clients, to use a car analogy, it's like, uh, you know, they, they think about cars and how people buy them. They think, they think of it as a car as a car, right? Um, and the, the car is a social thing, right? It's a, it's a car in a garage, in a home, in a world out, in, out there. Um, and I think uh, bringing that those insights that help inform how people actually shop and buy cars, for instance, um, is a really powerful thing for our clients to know. So I'm excited about continuing to push anthropology um, in the field um, and, uh, and helping uh, clients with kind of new ways of thinking. So that's kind of what, what drives me uh, and uh, I find really exciting. And, you know, when it, when I see it, 
when I see eyes open with clients um, and they understand thing a little, something a little bit more intuitively because I've been able to bring them something, I think that's really, really powerful and that's what drives me. But, but yeah, um, that's, that's what I'm excited about. Very good. And where can everybody find you? I'm on you? LinkedIn. I think that's probably the, the uh, more, more common place. Uh, I'm also on uh, Twitter. I don't tweet very much. I'm more of a, more of a retweeter of my musings, things that I learn and listen to, so I can be found there at uh, To Live and Tweet in LA uh, to play off the, the famous song. So um, those are two places I can be found. Great. Well, Stephen, it was a blast. Thanks. I uh, really enjoyed hearing about your work. So thanks for everything. Thanks uh, for coming thanks, on and Matt. sharing that with everybody. Thank you for listening to the Anthropology and Business Podcast. To learn everything you need to break into business anthropology and why business anthropology is one of the best lenses for contributing to business success, visit my website at madarts.me, where I cover many topics related to business anthropology and beyond. There you will find all the podcast episodes, blogs, and news. Please like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.